war is over and boys are on their way home. For most people, they return to their old ways and try to forget the past. But others have different ideas and guns are in plentiful supply. Time for deadly mischief. Over to you, James, to describe one such tale that became a recurring theme of post-war Britain. Britain, in 1946, was broken and exhausted after the long war. And there was a time of austerity and hardship for years to come, as the long process of rebuilding a nation began. One escape from reality was a weekly visit to the cinema. And what better to watch than a rip-roaring Hollywood western, with the 7th Cavalry fighting it out with the Red Indians, the real Native Americans, who understandably were defending their way of life and their lands. Many of us have watched these films in the past. The wagon trains, cattle herds, buffaloes, arrows and bullets flying around everywhere in the Wild West, and the so-called good guys and girls winning the day. How better to spend five shillings and five pence and two hours to escape the grim grind outside, in front of the silver screen. One such evening in the not-so-wild west country of England's city of Bristol, such a tableau was playing out in a packed Odeon cinema on the corner of Union Street and Nelson Street in the central Broadmead area, coincidentally on the site of the original Fry's chocolate factory. But one of the bullets was not on the screen. The first the audience heard about it was when the film stopped and a message announcing, Is there a doctor in the house? Some of the cinema staff had heard a gunshot, but naturally assumed that it came from the film. One of them went to the refreshment area for a cup of tea, where they discovered not only the source of the shot, but also the body of the 33-year-old manager called Robert Jackson, who was sprawled on the floor with blood coming from his head. He was barely conscious and was making mumbling noises. The chair he must have been seated on was on its side, but everything else in the room was undisturbed, so no signs of a struggle. The police and an ambulance were called, and Jackson was rushed to the British Royal Infirmary. A police officer was dispatched with the ambulance, hoping to gain information on the attack as soon as possible. Sadly, the patient died in the early hours of the morning, without gaining consciousness. He left a wife and a four-year-old son, as well as a mystery to be solved. Jackson had resided with his family in Zetland Road, and had been the manager at the cinema for several years. Previously, he had been in the Royal Navy for five and a half years as a gunner. Years earlier, he had even tried his hand in Hollywood, getting a few small acting parts and working part-time as a radio announcer, but eventually he had returned to England. He had an exemplary work record at the cinema, and was well-liked by staff and customers alike, and would also take part in charity fundraising events. The police went about their business, looking into what had occurred at the cinema. The audience filed out, the doors locked, and the staff assembled for questioning. It emerged that just before the shooting, Jackson had been laughing with the restaurant staff, having previously secured the box office takings in the safe in his office. When eventually opened with the keys from the manager's pocket, the money was found undisturbed, a little over £300. The police were faced with three questions that needed to be answered. What was the motive behind the murder of a popular, hard-working individual? The murder weapon was not found at the scene of the crime, and needed to be recovered. And finally, who was the cinema-goer who alerted the police? The answer to the third question surfaced a few days later, after an appeal for witnesses by the police. The caller came forward and gave a fairly detailed statement as to the events that had happened. From this statement there emerged information that there was a man in his thirties, dark hair and wearing a rather shabby suit, who was seen loitering in the cinema lounge between 5.30 and 6 o'clock, a short time before the shooting. A couple of the staff did have vague recollections seeing this person, but at the time had thought no more about it. It turned out that he'd had a snack and a cup of tea, and then sat down in the lounge area and started to read a newspaper. 
He had told an usherette that he was waiting for somebody. A second man had also been spotted, who was described as shabbily dressed and wearing a rather battered hat. The staff remembered him, as he appeared to be rather nervous and furtive. The police issued a statement asking for these persons to come forward so that they could be eliminated from their inquiries. Around the same time, the cinema's car park attendant recalled a blue car that was parked for some time with a well-dressed woman in the driving seat. He recalled that from time to time she would get out of the car and look up and down Union Street as if she was expecting somebody. She also appeared to be rather flustered. The police did not know whether these individuals had any information that could be of use, but they needed to know if they could recall anything, even the smallest detail, that could help solve the puzzle. In the early hours of the morning after Jackson had been murdered, the night watchman from another nearby cinema, the New Palace Theatre in Baldwin Street, had come across an intruder. It was around 1.30 in the morning when he heard a bang at the front doors, thinking initially it was the policeman making sure that they were properly secured. When he heard more knocks and bangs, he decided to investigate and saw a man standing by the pay booth in the vestibule of the cinema. The night watchman shouted out to the man to clear off and when he made no attempt to leave, he blew his whistle to call for assistance. This was enough to deter the intruder, who ran off in the direction of Bristol Bridge. The police arrived a few moments later, but after a search could find no trace of this man in the area. The initial thoughts of the murder investigators was that the motive for the shooting had been robbery, with the killer making good his escape along a corridor to the rear exit. Jackson hadn't been discovered for several minutes after he was attacked, giving ample time for the culprit to get away undetected. An appeal was made by the police, asking if any members of the public had seen anyone using the rear exit around the time of the murder. Professor Webster, the pathologist, gave evidence at the inquest on the death of Jackson and outlined the nature of his injuries. These were a single gunshot to the head, fracturing the victim's skull, together with bleeding and lacerations to the brain. The bullet entered the skull just above the right eye when he was shot. There was no gunshot residue suggesting that the gun had been discharged at a medium distance from its intended target. Webster suggested that it was a large calibre handgun, possibly a service revolver. He dismissed any suggestion that the shot had been self-inflicted. With exceptionally little to go on, despite a detailed search of the cinema, they widened their search to every back alley, bomb site, and air raid shelter in the city in an attempt to find the murder weapon. Scores of people were interviewed. A watch was kept on Temple Mead's railway station and included stations all across the West Country, as well as the local ports and docks. Searches were carried out in Yeovil and Bridgewater. Cars were stopped as far afield as the Midlands and the occupants questioned. In Cardiff, detectives made inquiries in hotels, guest houses and hostels. Descriptions of people that the police wanted to speak to were shown on the screens of cinemas across Bristol and beyond. Some people were rounded up, but were subsequently eliminated from the inquiry. None of the potential suspects ever came forward. A few days after the murder, a cafe owner in Clifton, in Bristol, contacted the police. He reported that a man closely matching the description of one of the possible suspects had had a cup of tea at about 20 past five in the afternoon on the Friday after the murder was committed. When he left, he seemed uncertain as to where he was going. The manager spotted the same man later in the day, walking aimlessly along the street in the rain. Three weeks later, a man matching the same description vanished from a house in Clifton. The police, however, were able to track him down and discovered he had a legitimate reason to be away from Bristol and he was eliminated from their inquiries. Around the same time, there was a description of a similar man who had been aggressive in the city centre. It was discovered that he had not been in Bristol on the day in question. Towards the end of July, a workman who was doing maintenance on a water tank 
near to the cinema, discovered a Colt 45 semi-automatic handgun. Coincidentally, a GI from the US Army had escaped from detention in Dieppe in France, presumably boarding a ship bound for the port of Bristol. There were reports that the deserter had been seen in the Bristol area, and naturally the murder investigators were keen to speak to him, as were the military police, and they joined forces to track him down. After a widespread search, they failed to find him. Despite all their efforts, the police were no nearer discovering who the killer of Jackson was, let alone the motive. Robbery was high on their list. Had the robber been disturbed by the cinema manager? If this was the case, it was possible that the criminal was familiar with the layout of the cinema and the usual daily routine, and knew exactly where the money was stored. A past employee, perhaps? Someone with insider knowledge would know when and where to strike. The escape route would not have been public knowledge. It is interesting to note that the fatal shot coincided with the bullets flying on that part of the film being shown on the big screen. Coincidence? Maybe, maybe not. Could the murder have been due to a completely different matter between victim and assailant, completely unconnected directly with the cinema, thus ruling out any idea of a botched robbery? At the time, a suggestion was mooted that the genial manager had a bit of an eye for the ladies. Could his death be due to the actions of a disgruntled husband? Was the nervous woman in the car park somehow part of it? Was the break-in a short time after the murder at a nearby cinema connected in some way or not? There are more theories than facts concerning this case. No progress was ever made, and the case remained unsolved with all lines of inquiry exhausted. As a postscript in the 1990s, a man named Jeff Fisher visited the police and spoke to detectives about his father, named Billy. The account given by Jeff was that his father had made a deathbed confession in connection with the murder of Jackson. Fisher Sr. had been in cahoots with another petty criminal by the name of Ducky Leonard. Both had travelled from South Wales over to Bristol with a plan to rob Yodin Cinema in Broadmead. Their attempt had been disturbed by the manager, Jackson, and in the fiore that followed, the fateful shot was made. Which one fired the gun is unclear, but since the culprits were now dead, the police were unable to corroborate this information. Make of it what you will. To this day, the police file on the murder of Robert Jackson remains marked unsolved. So, John... This is a curious case. What are your feelings about it? One of the curious aspects of murder is that the victim and the culprit actually know each other. Police action is often helped by the culprit walking into police custody and admitting their guilt. In addition, they provide the police with extra evidence even though it makes no difference to their sentence. Within a week, the gallows beckon, irrespective of them helping police with their inquiries. What happens when the two protagonists do not know each other? In the place the size of Bristol, you are in the dark, especially in the days before mobile phones with cameras or CCTV. Even if you locate the murder weapon and find fingerprints, you are no wiser unless the culprit has a criminal record. At the time of the murder, forensics had certainly advanced, but DNA evidence was the stuff of science fiction. Unless the murderer is careless and leaves clues, the police are helpless. Matters are made worse if the murderer disposes of the body. Nielsen was only caught when a dialer rod man was called to unblock drains. The other problem is motive. People kill other people as their emotions get the better of them. In the Odeon case, the motive was probably money, not a crime of passion or a botched suicide attempt. Witnesses were found, but where do you find a shabbily dressed man in his early 30s? Even if you were recently demobbed with a new pinstripe suit, you would not use it to go to the cinema. Where were you going to buy another, under rationing? The film The Blue Lamp showed the villain, a young Dirk Bogart, killing a policeman, played by Jack Warner, being hunted down by both the police and the underworld at the end. But let us be honest here, robberies of this type were a constant feature of post-war Britain. 
Unlike the Canadian Mounties, the police rarely got their man. <laughs> <laughs>